Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I've got a few announcements to make before we begin our present study here in 1 Thessalonians. Now, I recently did some videos on uh, the judgment seat of Christ, and we need to understand that Bema, uh, if we, to understand it correctly, uh, we need to realize that there will be no sense of lack or wanting on the part of any of God's children, even by those whose entire life's work was hay, wood, and stubble. No saint will live eternally without a full reward because of that refining process. We won't all have the same capacity to glorify God throughout eternity, yet we will all, each, every one of us do that, yet in the, in the experience of every saint, every, every single saint, our cup will be full, even running over any idea that, that some will be regarded as less honorable or less worthy or less important in any sense of the term. You know, as if, as, as if to carry human merit into eternity is blatantly false. I recently posted uh, to Facebook how that in Matthew 24-7, that nation shall rise against nation, uh, kingdom against kingdom. And I understand that this is a tribulation period context. I under, understand that the context of Matthew 24 is the time of Jacob's trouble and, and the context is the day of the Lord. However, we are living so close that we're seeing much of what we're seeing in, in Matthew 24, even right now. I want to point out the fact that the word nation there is ethnos, in the Greek, it's where we get the word, our word ethnicity. Ethnic group shall rise against ethnic group. Well, take a look around you. And our Lord went on to say, kingdom against kingdom. Now, if ethnos, nation, if, if it meant nation as, as we use the term, you know, as in USA, uh, China, Russia, North Korea, whatever, then why would he mention kingdom? against kingdom but again take a look around you and look at the conflict between nations so the point being here uh, we're, we're seeing conflict between nations we're seeing conflict between races you know for nearly 20 years now uh, i guess or more even we've lived with constant alerts and breaking news you can't turn on the tv without seeing that with no signs of this letting up. So, you know, for those of you who think that, that his return is not near, I invite you to think again. Now, I found another Trump 7 the other day. I find this most interesting. Today is Friday. Tomorrow, Trump is coming here to Oklahoma. He's coming to Tulsa. It'll be one of the biggest uh, rallies he's probably ever held uh, since the coronavirus, since the, the, the shutdown. He'll hold his next rally in Tulsa, June 20, that's tomorrow, Saturday. That is seven months exact before his first term ends. Now, I found that fairly interesting. That's, you can just pile that on top of all the other sevens. On April 12, I found this interesting. On April 12, the U.S. became the leading country in COVID cases. And it just happened to be Easter Sunday. What I find intriguing about that is that, you know, the U.S. led the world in cases of a plague of death on the day that commemorates Jesus' resurrection to life. Or you could even say our resurrection to life since we were raised with Him. So that's it for the announcements. I may make a few of these before each study from here on out. Uh, so we're moving along in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We covered verses 1 through 4 in our last video, our first video on, on Thessalonians. So we're going to continue on with that. So I just in, I thank you, all of you for your continued participation and interest in this ministry, Blessed Hope Forever. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you once again for allowing us to feast upon your word together. I ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, in uh, the first video, 
verses one through four, we covered the, the fact the the uh, some what I believe are, are were some of the most remarkable elements of any one of Paul's epistles. It's grace and peace, you know, mentioned right up front that we have grace and peace that we give thanks for one another. We're always remembering one another in our prayers without ceasing. Uh, our work of faith, our labor of love, our patience of hope, uh, that's in the sight of God. I believe that phrase to be saying that this is what God looks at. And knowing, brethren, beloved, your election. And I pointed out how that, that knowing is a perfect tense. That we are brethren, we are loved by God, and God chose us. Now, it may seem like I'm moving a little fast here, but I've got a lot of, to cover, I believe, in this video. I'm, I'm believing that I can knock out this first chapter uh, pretty concisely. If you'll bear with me, I think you're going to find something really kind of interesting. Now, when we look at verse 5, I'll, I'll put that up here on the, on the screen, verse 5. We see that our, our gospel came in power and in the Holy Spirit not as the word of man, but of God. Now, we tend to, oftentimes, and I've pointed this out in the past, we tend to look over these verses, we read through them, and we don't really take time to stop and spend some time in that verse to kind of just really become comfortable with what the word is saying, to, to meditate on it, to even maybe perhaps pray on it, about it. We, we, we just rush over it too quickly that's at least that's my contention. I've pointed this out in the past. You know, it's we almost want to take things for granted. We want to take sentences and statements for granted. Our gospel came in power and in, and in the Holy Spirit. And Steve, I know that. That's that's kind of well. That's a given. Everybody knows that. Not as the word of man, but of God. And and I, my question to you, folks, is: Do we understand what that really means? Are we taking the time to really consider what that's, that verse is saying? In power. Whose power? His, not ours. Not as the word of man. Not as the word of man, but of God. And, and there's, there's two aspects of this. It's how it came to us, as well as how we deliver that gospel to others. And what we expect others would... How, how we, ex we often tend to expect a response from these individuals in which we give the gospel to. Not as the word of man, but of God. And where is our power to persuade men? You know, to actually affect something as supernatural as the new birth. Now, contrary to popular belief, you know, that says if we just work hard enough, we can get that person saved. You know, some preachers, they just got away with words. You know, I don't, but, you know, other preachers do. And folks, modern evangelism is founded on the false premise, the false belief that if a person wills, he can be born again from above. Somehow that his decision and God's decision sort of collide with one another. And folks, that's not the truth. That is not the truth. The power really rests upon man's decision, they say. You know, his will, man's will, not God's. In fact, the text will go on to say, having received the word in much affliction, in much affliction. Well, let's, let's stop and think about that for a moment. In the midst of much opposition from others. You know, as we continue on, this opposition will be identified. We, didn't, we can't just fill in the blanks here, just put there whatever we think that opposition might be. Scripture interprets Scripture in the midst of such of much opposition from others. So we didn't decide to be born again. Our affliction, our opposition, being, you know, uh, uh, our our former way of life that wasn't that wasn't our 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 tribulation, our trials, our troubles. Now many of you may believe that that's what that's talking about. I do not. Our affliction, our opposition being, well, that was our former way of life and how we lived, and that was all of our trouble. That was all of our tribulation. Having received the word in much affliction. It was in that 
that, that tribulation. The word there is tribulation. In the, in the Greek, the word is tri means tribulation. That's how Paul is saying that we received the word, was in much affliction. The word is, is persecution, tribulation. You know, it wasn't our old bar, you know, our old bartender, you know, or, you know, that persecuted us. It wasn't our, our non-believing family that persecuted us. It wasn't our, our old friends that, that, that caused us that tribulation. Having received the word in much tribulation. If we go back to Galatians chapter 4, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. I hope that what you're seeing here is what I'm seeing. That this, this opposition, this tribulation, that, that the Word came to us while we were in that affliction, has nothing to do with the world that doesn't know God. It is a religious persecution, a religious affliction, a religious tribulation. That's when the Word came in to our lives. And it came in in much assurance. The text says assurance. That's conviction, confidence. The text goes on to say, you know how we conducted ourselves among you for your sake, Okay, and with what zeal and diligence we exerted ourselves for your sakes. That's, that's seeking your advantage, Paul says, not our own. Not our own, but seeking your advantage. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm absolutely positive that there are those who, could, who would have every right, and I don't blame them, I wouldn't blame them if they did, would stand and argue that what that's saying, Steve, really what that's saying is that, uh, you know, this gospel that we preach that man must do something to be redeemed, we want this individual to be saved, and so we're not seeking our own advantage. We're seeking their advantage. We're seeking their advantage because we want them to do something to be redeemed. And I can understand that argument. I do not believe that that's what the text is saying. I do not believe that at all. Folks, there is a grace side to this and there's a law side to this. And perhaps maybe I, many of you out there, I, I can understand how that you might want to take and, and question my uh, understanding of, of or how I'm presenting this and, and, and even, even going as, as far as, as accusing me of a little prejudice. Well, Steve, you know, you're looking at everything from a grace sort of perspective, so you're, you've, you're prejudicing the text and you're, you're, you know, you're presenting everything from that sort of, that, from that position, you know. But uh, it could also be looked at from a standpoint of law. But folks, a serious, honest study of the Word will not allow you to, to reach that conclusion. Verse 6, you became followers, imitators. The word is mimic in the Greek. It doesn't mean that we become righteous, any more righteous by our imitating, our, our, our mimicking one another. We're already righteous. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. But you became followers, imitators of us and the Lord. That's a, that's a like-mindedness. And, and again, I'll say that there is a like-mindedness among those who live according to the law. But there's also a like-mindedness concerning those who understand that they, were, they are loved by God, they were chosen by God, that they were born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. And so that's the position that I have to maintain here. You became imitators of us and the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction, the, the text says, you know, the word there is interesting. The, the word means uh, it, uh, it's a challenge of coping with the internal pressure of, of, a, of a tribulation, especially when feeling that there's no way of escape. You feel confined. You feel hemmed in. You're, you're in a corner. You're trapped. 
Okay? That's, that's basically what the word means. Now, as from where I'm standing, from a, from a grace perspective, I can easily see uh, or understand. I mean, to me, it makes perfect sense why the Holy Spirit would use a word like that. Because that's what law does. It makes us feel hemmed in. It makes us feel confined. It makes us feel trapped. We're afflicted. We're in tribulation. We don't know which way to turn. And it was in that, that affliction that the Word came to us. Are you following me here? That's in the midst of much opposition from others. Okay? I want to read you a few verses from Acts chapter 17. Now when they had traveled through, and this is Acts 17 verses 5 through 8. Now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of, of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, they formed a mob and they set the city in an uproar. Oh, what does that remind you of? Okay, I'm getting off track there. They set the city ablaze. And attacking the house of Jason. That's, that's a name you don't hear too often. I'm going to talk a little more about Jason. They were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they didn't find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the, to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another King Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Well, just a little more about Jason. He was born in Tarsus. He was appointed bishop of Tarsus by Paul uh, with another apostle. He traveled to the island of Corfu where they built a church in honor of Stephen, the one who was martyred, the one who was stoned. And they converted many, uh, many pagans to the faith. And seeing this, the, the king of Corfu threw him into prison where they converted seven other prisoners to the Christian faith, and I can name these. These are uh, Saturnius, uh, uh, uh Faustianus, Januarius, Marsalius, and Euphrasius, and, and Mammius. There were seven. And the king, he had those seven put to death for their faith in boiling pitch. Boiling pitch. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, because untold numbers of our brethren have died horrible deaths because of their testimony of faith regarding what? The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which most Christians today, and I put that in quote, most Christians today hate with an everlasting flame. That's why I'm telling you this. Remember those seven the next time that the world religious system based on human merit persecutes you, afflicts you for your most precious faith. Jason of Thessalonica was a Jewish convert and an early Christian believer. His, his house in Thessalonica was used as a refuge by Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Non-believing Jews in Thessalonica stirred up a riot and Jason was arrested when the authorities couldn't locate Paul or Silas and he was made to post bail. My point is here, folks, is that the context was Jewish persecution. Religious persecution. Religious in nature. 
and others were offended and fell off from hearing the word. We're looking at here in the text receiving with with Holy Spirit joy. The original text it's 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 literally reads received with Holy Spirit joy. What is what is that? What's that joy? That is that joy, folks, is grace recognized. You recognized grace and you had joy. Yeah, it's just that simple. Decami. Uh, warmly receptive, welcoming, okay, means receive with ready reception what is offered. That's what the Thessalonians did. Verse 7, you were examples to all that believe. That is, all believers, okay, you were examples. If we look at that word, it means a stamp struck by a die, okay, a figure, a copy, an image, a pattern. Think of a, a Xerox copy machine, okay. That's what the word means. Ye were examples to all that believe. Figures, copies, images, patterns, models, types of one another. That's what we are. That's what the gospel does. It, it prefigures something or somebody. And, and, and we're definitely looking at unity there. It shows unity and oneness. Verse 8, from you sounded out the word. Sounded out. Is what the text says, loud and clear in every place. The word sounded out, that word there is actually the word in the Greek. Uh, exake, exa, it's kind of hard to pronounce. Exake, say, exake, say, it refers to the sounding of a trumpet. That's right. The idea is that the gospel was proclaimed like the voice of a trumpet echoing from place to place. If you compare Isaiah 58, 1, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. In Revelation 1, 10, which most of us are familiar with, John hears God's voice, which is like a loud trumpet. Okay? Your faith toward God word is spread abroad. It's, it has gone abroad. It's a perfect active indicative. Perfect tense there, folks. It's, it's gone abroad. It's spread abroad with the effect, a past action, completed past action with the effect that it continues on. The results of that continues on into the present and, and, and I'll say beyond. That's the perfect tense. Has gone abroad. And we need not to speak anything. We have no need to say anything, Paul says. Well, that's, that's a little... Uh, that was a t for me, that was a tough one. I had to wrangle through that. What is Paul really saying? What is the, the Holy Spirit really saying here when he says, through Paul, he says, we need not to speak anything. We, as in Paul and his companions. We need not speak anything. We have no need to say anything. Well, you can take that as meaning, uh, I'll give you a couple options. You can take that as meaning they themselves, the people in Macedonia, Achaia, and in every place, they, they know it already, which I don't believe that to be saying, though it, it may be true. Or we can, we can add, uh, or we can't add, we cannot add anything to what God has said, which I, now it could be both. But I believe that that's what the text is saying. We can't add anything to the Word of God. It is both sufficient and efficient. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4.11. 1 Peter 4.11. As I was going through this, I believe the Holy Spirit led me to 1 Peter 4.11. If any man speaks, let him speak the very words of God. Verse 9, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome, that is reception. The word means reception, entrance. It's like a doorway, an entrance, a gate. They keep talking about the wonderful welcome that you gave us. How you turned back, that is converted, returned to God from the idols, false gods, false worship to serve the God living and true 
is the arrangements of the word in the original text. We know that, that from Peter, we return unto the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. Okay? And idols are literal things, for sh to, to be sure. Okay? I mean, I don't want to minimize the, the, the fact that idols are literal. Solid objects. They can be made of stone. They can be made of anything fleshly and carnal that the mind and the, and the heart are set on. Money, anything else. Spiritually speaking, idols represent any form of false worship. That's the underlying uh, current uh, as far as the word is concerned there. That's the underlying definition. They, can they, they do represent forms of false worship. And in contrast, we worship God in spirit and in truth. So the application, I believe, for us here is that we ourselves, we, we it is, the text is saying that you and I, we turn from false forms of worship to serve the true living God. Whether it was a statue, a tree, a whale, self, yeah, you, self can be, become an idol, or other religious forms of worship, folks. Law-keeping as a rule of life is a form of self-worship where that we ourselves became the idol. That was the result from that law-keeping, that fleshly-oriented law, legalistic-based system of human merit, which I remind you, the text says that this, is, this condition or the state that we were in, which was very troubling to us, very afflictive when the Word came to, into our lives. I hope that made sense. Folks, that's what I'm seeing in the text. And to wait constantly. That's constantly wait. It's a present tense. Actively wait with rising intensity and clarity about our blessed hope for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead who is presently delivering. That is, and by the way, that, that is not sozo. Our familiar word, sozo, deliverance, saved, sozo. It's not sozo. It's ruamai is the word. It's a different word. But it does mean rescue, deliver from danger or destruction. And that refers to all of us. Us all. Ek, out from the wrath coming. It is a ongoing, He's presently ongoing, continually delivering us from the wrath that's coming. That's what the text is saying. It's not that He did do that. He's continually doing that. The present tense says He's continually doing that. He's constantly doing that. He was doing that with the Thessalonians. He's doing that with us. That is the basis, folks, of our hope that we have not only been redeemed, but are constantly being delivered out of, away from the presence of God's wrath that is soon to fall upon His creation. Okay? So we can see that pre-trib rapture is actually related to the person and the work of Christ Himself. You know, the easiest thing would be to say that He is delivering us from hell here. That's, that's what that's saying, that, that wrath means hell. But wait a minute. We were delivered from hell when He redeemed us, the minute that He died in our place. And, you know, some people say that Paul couldn't have been speaking about theologic, theological or, I mean, or es eschatological things here. Uh, some of the commentators I read said that. Uh, I don't believe that for a moment. The wrath of God is an intrinsic part of the Gospel. He delivered us from hell when He died in our place. That, folks, is a finished transaction. Therefore, we are delivered out from the wrath that is coming on the non-believing world. But if right here, if wrath meant hell, there would be no need for the present tense. And it's also articulated, the wrath. So if the definite article is there, it's a reference of previous mention or, or a reference uh, to specific identity. This is a specific wrath. You don't, you don't hang in between heaven and hell depending on what you do, folks. A lot of Christians believe that nonsense. Hell is also not something that is coming. Hell exists. It exists right now. The wrath is that which is coming upon the world. Isaiah 13, 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, 
and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. We are constantly, presently being delivered out from the wrath to come, is what our text is saying. So now I'd like to end this on, a, on somewhat of a personal note, a message, particularly to those of you, of you who have come to understand the gospel, okay, through someone's teaching, whether it was mine or someone else's, or, or on your own. Just come to understand the gospel of grace. And, and particularly to those who, who have come to understand that through my coming to visit you here and the preaching of the true gospel, where you heard the true gospel on this YouTube channel. And I want you to see if this sounds familiar. I'm going I'm to speak a little from my heart here, and I want, I want, I want you to just see how much this lines, aligns itself with the text, the first chapter that we've just looked at. Knowing we have received grace and peace from God, for I want to give thanks for all of you people here on this YouTube channel. You're constantly in my prayers because of your faith, because of your labor of love and the enduring hope that we all share, which I know our God sees and recognizes. I'm thankful that you know God loves you and that He chose you. Your election of God. I know that you didn't accept the truth of the gospel as my word, but that the gospel alone has the power to give you that confidence and conviction and assurance. It certainly didn't come from me. You know how I have conducted myself in your presence here and with what zeal and diligence that I've exerted myself for y'all's sake, seeking your advantage, not my own. Where those of you who have come to realize the truth of the gospel have come to imitate me and the Lord and others who share that same faith, where that we, we share this truth in common, also know how you have received the truth of the gospel in the face of much religious opposition, okay? Opposition of, of God's own design, where that others were offended and fell away from hearing the word. Instead, you received it with true joy, having recognized God's grace being ready to accept the truth that was offered so that we became, in a sense, copies of one another, where that we shared a common unity and a oneness of fellowship. We know that God's Word has gone forth. We know it's gone forth, sounded forth like a trumpet, loud and clear, where that His sheep are hearing. They are hearing His voice. You all welcome me into your lives. You, you return to God. You converted from all other forms of false worship, serving the true and living God, and are actively, constantly awaiting with rising intensity and clarity our blessed hope, where our Lord is presently delivering us from the wrath to come. You just heard me paraphrase with a fair degree of accuracy chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, which I see as a, confir as a confirmation that, that we're not just reading the text, folks, but we're living it. Nothing compares to our actually seeing ourselves in the text. It's like gazing into a mirror. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank you all for your continued love, prayers, messages of encouragement and support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.